All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for bearing with us through the uh, fire drill. Our, well, it wasn't really a fire drill. But the good thing was it wasn't us. Uh, somebody burnt some corn uh, or popcorn, and uh, we'll be invited back next year, hopefully. Um, so um, uh, the next gentleman uh, that's about to speak, uh, he's a co-founder of um, Point3. Uh, they're giving, they're, they're um, actually um, hosting a CTF here today, uh, one of the sponsors and one of the co-founders. So please help me welcome um, Eric Dornbush. Hey, thanks everyone. So uh, feel free to heckle, and um, if this doesn't work, pull a fire alarm, we'll be, we'll be totally fine. Uh, so this is actually an encore presentation uh, that uh, we did for the National Institute for Cybersecurity Education. Uh, the National Institute for Cybersecurity Education runs an annual conference. Um, their conference is by data scientists with PhDs in uh, data modeling and academic theory for data scientists with PhDs in education theory and, 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 and learning models. Um, I am not a data scientist. Uh, I don't have a PhD in either education theory or learning models. Um, I actually am not a data scientist or have a PhD in anything, so I'm just a guy. Uh, I ran color commentary for the first run of this talk uh, to uh, Dr. Gallagher's play-by-play. Uh, -play. And so, uh, as you can see, Dr. Gallagher isn't here. Um, we wish Shane a speedy recovery. He had a medical emergency uh, this morning, so hopefully I can fill his shoes in today uh, and be both colorful um, and informative. Uh, so the talk is actually called, I have to read this one, uh, Leveraging the Right Learning Model and Embedded Analytics for Outstanding Results in Cyber Operator Training. That's a little terse, a little academia focused, um, and also indicative of the next 67 slides that follow this one. So stay with me. Uh, in the spirit of B-Sides, um, we'll be winging it, we'll be doing it live. Uh, so for now, I'd like to call the talk Smarter Ways to Get Skills or as the U.S. Department of Defense calls it, leveraging models and analytics and right, a lot of you know, stuff, that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, so a little bit of background, right? So the internet's a thing, right? It's not a fad, it's not going away. We probably need to pay attention to it, right? This is DOD policy, right? They've, they've said that, right? From a DOD perspective, internet's not going away, so we should pay attention to it. So my company was called in to meet with the Director of Force Readiness and Training for the U.S. Department of Defense. And he's like, guys, we are not prepared to fight a cyber war. Shit, all right, you got my attention, right? Like, what does that mean, right? So cyber warfare, as many in the audience probably know, is a series of vulnerability research, exploit development, effects. Usually you don't want to get caught while you're in the process of doing all those things. Most of the time you can't buy your targets, uh, your target uh, hardware or software like at the local Best Buy. So hard, right? You, you often can't copy paste your way to success, right? Not all of our targets are, are running Windows XP or some misconfigured version of PHP 5. Um, you know, you can't always just throw stuff in a Metasploit and, and, and have success against a nation state. So we need to train professionals. And so the director of force readiness says, hey, like, point three, you guys in? Fuck yeah, like, we're in, right? Like, how do we do this? So first thing we do is say, hey, what are you, what are you doing now? And the way that they're training now in the military is using something called the Victorian model, which any American citizen in this audience is familiar with the Victorian model, right? Rows and rows of, of, of desks and chairs and students, canned lectures, boring PowerPoint, multiple choice tests, everybody memorizes the definition of the thing, cramps for the test, forgets the next day, like nobody wins. It's, it's an awful way of learning, particularly this craft. And so they have a schoolhouse that they call JCAC. I wish Shane was here because I don't know what that, does anyone know what that stands for? Anyone go? Yeah. Cyber awesome. And you went through it. Did you go through JCAC? Okay. Yeah. Oh, is it awesome? So yes. <laughs> yes. We got winners. So anyway, for those who have gone to the joint something something something, um, dude, my condolences. Right. That sounds awful. Right. That's not how we learn. So the Pentagon came up with something called the Cyber Operations Academy course. So my understanding is that they wanted to call it the Cyber Operations course, and then they just didn't like the acronym. So we got the Cyber Operations Academy course. So we throw away the canned lectures. We give everyone nothing but keyboard experience the entire time. The very first challenge when you walk in our door is a use after free bug that relies on ROP chaining to gain execution. Right? That's the very first thing. And then you have the next six months to learn how to do that over and over again. Right? We focus on the hard stuff like uh, vulnerability research, zero-day exploit development. Uh, reverse engineering, malware analysis, in-memory forensics. Uh, we also emphasize soft skills. So we divide up the students into teams. Everything is team-based because that's how you work, that's how you fight. Um, 
the students are given hard problems, long times to solve them. We don't go through the whole like, all right, it's lunchtime, like if you can get the answer, it was 17, we come back, let's talk about cryptography, right? That, that doesn't work. So we give students weeks and weeks to solve some of these challenges. And as a result, they have to learn things like time and resource allocation. For some of the projects, we actually give the students a, a dollar budget where they have to go and, and buy things. So they got to determine like what's the best use of those funds. Division of labor, how to conduct briefings. Um, that's all emphasized in the, in the COAC. And so the course is, again, it's all hands-on. So we meet at 8 a.m., we meet at 12.30 p.m. for a big, you know, big family hug, right? Like, who is stuck on a thing and literally has no idea how to research the way out of it? All right, you're stuck. Like, let's all nudge that team along. Class, let's kind of debate this out. But for the most part, that's it. Then, you know, go back in your hole and work, right? And so the intent is a lot of these challenges are hard. But the, the thing that makes them hard is time, right? We know what we ultimately need to do. We just don't necessarily know how to get all the steps through. So great, we'll give you time and resources and a team to go solve those problems. So it turns out that this actually isn't new. It's, it's old. It's like dark ages and caveman old. So probably everyone in the audience is aware, like ours is a craft. And so the best way to learn is by doing. Right? It doesn't make sense to read a book about it. It doesn't make sense to watch a video or even to attend some of the talks and hear how somebody else did it. The best way to master a skill like this is to go and do it. So it's a craft that's all hands-on, and we, uh, we provide mentorship using something that is ages old, again, called the Journeyman Apprenticeship Model. Um, and uh, the rest of the time, again, just everyone is, is learning. And so <laughs> I've skipped about 15 slides here. Um, again, data scientists from the Institute for Defense Analyses, from the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative, and some experts from Booz Allen Hamilton came and evaluated everything. They evaluated the students, they evaluated the mentors, they evaluated the curriculum, the facilities, like everything. And so I, I'm not a data scientist, so we'll, we'll casually skip a dozen or so more slides, um, but know that there's all sorts of stuff about second order derivatives and taxonomy buried within here. If you are interested, I can give you a, a copy of the slides later. Uh, but this is ultimately how cognitive apprenticeships are, are modeled. Um, the intent is, at again, makes sense, right? At the very beginning, we're going to hold some hands, gather around class, let me show you how I do a thing. All right, now repeat what I just did. Now I'm going to step back. Now you guys do it. Now I'm going to step back to the doorway. Now I'm going to go down the hallway, and you guys just keep doing it for six months. Um, that's, that's the way that the COAC works. And so we've now gone through three pilots, of, or the DOD has gone through three pilots of COAC. And each of them has had a, a different um, objective. So the first objective is like, does this work, right? Intuitively, it makes sense. We learn by doing. I don't, you know, I, I can't take a multiple choice test to show that I understand how to program. I have to program, um, but we don't data to actually back that up. So we need to have a pilot and collect the data and, and show that it works. And and how how well does that work? The second pilot that we did was uh, to create parity. So again, the existing schoolhouse, JCAC, it stands for something, it's awful, it's, it's gross, uh, but that is the program of record. That is how the military is conducting uh, operations training now. And so um, we need to make sure that the COAC is in line with JCAC, so if ever there is a replacement, no, one, you know, no knowledge is, is, is lost. And then arguably the most powerful uh, was the most recent pilot we just wrapped up, um, does this apply to civilians, right? Or is this inherently a military thing? And um, that's really powerful, right? So does this apply to those who can't necessarily afford college, right? Those that don't have a litany of certificates. Um, that's really important, right? You can help break stereotypes. You can knock, up, uh, knock down gates that are set up by HR departments that are wiping out whole populations of qualified candidates from consideration in the workforce. And the second reason um, is a little more inherently military. Um, as you all know, if there is a cyber conflict in the future, it will not be in the public space, it will be in the private domain, right? Like, it's one thing to go, like, capture that hill and plant a flag and, you know, here's my territory, but, you know, the target space is banks, right? Utilities. Um, places that civilians have inherent ownership of, at least in the United States, and, and many other governments across the, across the world. And so, we also need to make sure that we're not only training the DOD gene pool, that we're also making sure that U.S. civilians have a knowledge base of how attackers are breaking into your network, getting past all of your hardened antivirus and firewalls and issues and detection, staying there without you having any clue, and then doing something that really gives you a bad day. Um, that uh, Awareness of that is, is inherently important, and that knowledge should be shared. 
uh, is the vision of, 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 uh, of our customer. And so, real quick on data, um, there were two research questions on the first pilot. So again, um, I have to read this one because this is, this is kind of important, right? So uh, question one is, uh, as a result of the course, right, did, did, did learning happen, right? It's important to, to capture. Uh, and the second thing is, how can we benchmark this style of learning against other forms of training? So the government, uh, the military in particular, is interested in, in, in this, right? So uh, doing the thing by awareness and concepts, doing the thing with code, uh, and then knowing who is your enemy. So that roughly is six months of curriculum. Um, so the data scientists came in and they created these things called mind maps. Uh, this is an example of a mind map. Uh, so it turns out that like to write your own exploit, um, you may need to know a thing or two about pointer arithmetic, which also means you may need to know a little bit about pointers and arithmetic. Uh, so this is a mind map of all the things that have to happen uh, in terms of cognitive awareness before you can actually complete the challenge. Um, there are pages and pages of these things for all of the exercises we run through, from keyloggers that don't get caught by antivirus, um, in-memory forensics, uh, detecting things that are normally not detected, and all the skill sets that go into it. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is the one for the keylogger. And so, who came to this COAC is, I think, one of the more interesting things. So. Um, that's a lot of words, so I'll, so I'll summarize. Uh, few people with formal experience, right? Few people with college degrees or college experience. Uh, one of the more shining stars of the course was uh, what the Air Force calls a cable dog. So a cable dog is the individual that goes to new facilities and runs low voltage ethernet cable through drywall. So that is his job, never touched a computer, like literally on the very first day of class we had to teach this kid right click from left click. Um, he is now reverse engineering malware. Uh, by the way, he's getting out of the services pretty soon. He's looking for the right employer. So if anyone is hiring, I'm more than happy to match make. Um, but you don't necessarily need experience to go into a curriculum like this and walk out with skills that matter. Uh, in terms of benchmarking, um, we had the students run through a number of independent assessments in addition to the ones that we as instructors created for the students. Uh, so the students went to uh, the Department of Energy's uh, annual cyber fire exercise. Um, and placed extremely well against professionals. We ran them through the OSCP curriculum. Everyone knows OSCP? Yeah, everyone's shaking head. Okay, so we had a 70% pass rate, 7-0, uh, on the first year. Again, most of the students came in with, no, they, weren't op they weren't operators, they weren't red teamers, they weren't analysts. We had linguists, we had all source analysts. We had a procurement specialist, like his job was to buy things, and, and now he's pass he passes OSCP. Um, we ran a heads up uh, DEF CON style capture the flag event called the A3 Cyber uh, All Against All. Um, our students, again, six months of instruction going against fully operational teams, professional military outfits that have gone through all the training and have their certs to operate and be effective. Um, NSA came in first place, uh, but our team came in second. Um, Coast Guard came in third, and uh, our second student team came in fourth. I might be mixed up. There were six teams. We captured sixth, fourth, and second, fourth, and sixth. Not bad for six months of training against fully operational teams that have been comp playing and 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 working together for years. Um, we also had an, uh, DoD brought in some uh, evaluation exercise sponsored by a third party, um, and our students benchmarked well against uh, just a global pool. So all of that lends itself to this. So I don't really know what's going on in this slide, but I know that there's a lot more green than purple, so something obviously happened. Um, something very important <laughs> happened, and that's the pre and post gains that you'll see throughout this style of learning are what's effective um, and consistent. So the 2016 pilot, so second iteration goals. Did we get lucky? Did we have just this magical, this magical set of students that really had experience and just lied on the application test? Uh, or can we do it again, right? And again, can we make this course uh, as similar to JCAC as possible? Uh, so we were given more students. Um, roughly speaking, they were similar in nature uh, to the first batch of students. Um, we evolved our curriculum to match the 180 learning objectives of JCAC. So let me explain that. So JCAC is 180 days, and so is COAC. 180 things you got to learn. The way that JCAC teaches is very, very linear, right? Today is cryptography. Today is Windows. Today is networking. Like, all right, it's the end of the day. You guys are now crypto experts, Windows experts, networking experts. Like, very, very structured. 
COAC, because it's challenge-based, we get to weave in all of those themes into an underlying set of challenges. Uh, and so again, going back to that keylogger exercise that we have, right? students have to develop a keylogger that does not get picked up by antivirus. Um, it's assumed in that process you have to learn a little bit of crypto and a little bit of Windows and a little bit of networking. So rather than having like today's crypto day, Windows day, network day, we, it's all a story that we can tell over six months. So we match all 100, uh, almost all 180 learning objectives. Uh, apparently JCAC does some classified stuff that we don't, our class is entirely unclassified. Um, so we, there were some things that we couldn't get, but we got pretty darn close. Uh, the assessment vehicles were the same, uh, so they went to DOE's uh, CyberFire exercise, they had the A3, they had a bunch of different uh, industry events that they went to. I think they ended up going to B-Sides DC or something and passing through a lot of, like Raytheon has their Game of Pwns challenge, and you know, all the vendors have their own capital. Our students were crushing them. Uh, OSCP this year, we had an 80% pass rate. Um, again, similar sets of students, linguists, procurement specialists, um, all sorts, not cyber people. So this year on the A3, uh, we, were, we had uh, eight teams, and the COAC students actually captured first and second place. So that means that the best teams that the military put up to us, um, there were two Marine CPTs, the cyber protection teams. Uh, the Coast Guard had their CPT. Um, there was actually an industry team, a, a private company of professional pen testers. Um, the COAC students with six months of experience came in first and second place on that event, and the other teams filtered down towards the bottom. All right, another bar graph. Um, looks like some awesomeness is happening. Any questions on this? Cool. Data, right? Data, it's exciting. So this is the one that, this is the part where I get excited on, on 2017. So how many times have we heard like, oh, you want to do security? Well, start as a help desk, right? Then you're a technician, uh, then you're a sysadmin, then you're a programmer, and then you're ready to be security. Like, who's the security specialist? You have to do all these crazy things, right? Or how many, how many jobs do you see on, on wherever you, you know, look online for job postings and it's like, I needed a PhD in this and these 12 certifications and you have to speak French, Italian, and Latin. Like, and none of those are even applicable to the job description because there's no other way of benchmarking uh, and, and it's, it's frankly, it's, 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 it's not good for a big percentage of our nation that does not have college degrees. Uh, and so we looked at our pilot demographics. Um, I'm kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, when we look back at the individuals that went through the course in years one and years two, these were a lot of junior enlisted men and women, uh, no or little college experience. Um, we now have two years of data on these individuals. They've now gone back into the workforce and they are winning awards. They are getting citations from their employers, um, doing some really cool work. Um, and again, they're going, uh, placing at SANS Net Wars, again, Raytheon's competition, and some others. So the students are, are the alumni now are, are just rocking it in the real world as well. They're engaged, they're staying active in the community. Really neat stuff, right? Very inspiring stuff. And so, we now can say, hey, maybe this style of training can be used to address an underserved population. So DOD forged a partnership with the city of Chicago, uh, and uh, this summer uh, at the, at the uh, city's community college, the uh, City College of Chicago uh, in Chicago, uh, this program was brought to approximately 25 students. Uh, roughly speaking, one third were military, and two thirds were from Chicago, uh, many from the south side. Um, you can see some of the examples of the students that we were given. Um, we had a Peapod driver, a bank teller. Um, one of the students literally was homeless um, and had just a lot going on in his personal life, right? And like, that's a lot to deal with by itself. Now you're tacking on 40 hours a week of like reverse engineering and malware analysis. Right? The guy had a lot of bad days. Um, but he went through the course and, and graduated. Uh, in terms of results, uh, so the course has ended. We're still looking at data analytics. Um, again, that's, that's Shane's imaginary Shane, like that's Shane's job. Um, but anecdotally, it does look like people are happy. So the measures of success are now real world. Um, we're not necessarily caring about who placed what at CyberFire or whatnot. But to the civilians, the number one interest for going through a course like this was jobs. Um, it looks like we have somewhere between 85 and 100% job placement. Um, many of those jobs paying pretty decent wages. Um, some of the candidates, uh, some of the alumni have, have they've declined offers. They're waiting for the right employer. So again, if anyone's hiring, I am more than happy to match make you with some pretty solid talent today. 
On the military side, the individuals already employed, so getting a job wasn't really a measure of success. For them, uh, the measure of success was that OSCP cert. Um, this opens up very specific career enhancements. Um, I'm told I, I, I'm not in the military, but OSCP was like the reason why many of those individuals went to uh, went to class. So we just found out yesterday uh, that of the we had eight military students that sat for the exam, and all eight passed the exam on their first or second attempt. So that makes them um, eligible for promotion, eligible for certain job roles that they weren't eligible for before having that cert. Very cool. So the data science aspect of this presentation uh, is on metrics, uh, particularly with XAPI. So um, XAPI is an open spec. Uh, the DoD apparently created it many, many years ago and opened, uh, open sourced it. Um, we. Uh, we use it in our class. Um, I'll explain in a second. But what's nice about XAPI is it enables us to hook at different positions of the challenges. And that lets us measure uh, how far people are advancing, how quickly they're advancing. Uh, we can, in some cases, determine levels of frustration, right? Like, it's been a while since you've gotten to the next step, but you continue to be logging in. You're engaged, which is good, but you're not progressing, which is, you just need a little bit of love, right? And that's the whole point of the course. Uh, so um, our platform that we use is called Escalate. Um, we are talking about, like, shameless plug, right? You can absolutely try it for free at privesk.me, right? Privesk.me, everyone go to privesk.me. Um, that's the learning platform that we use in the course. And so um, with with Escalate being XAPI enabled, again, it, it allows not only access to the challenges, but also the instructors and all of those analytic capabilities on the back end. So we can see things like who's logging in, uh, and when, uh, when folks are stuck, uh, when and where individuals are going when they want help, and then we can determine are those resources useful. Right? If everyone goes to a particular website and then comes back with the answer, that's a, that's a good website, we should keep track of that, right? or archive it or something. People are going to watch this video and it doesn't help, that's not a good resource. Um, we can also measure things like learning pathways. This is the next generation of uh, academic modeling. I, I can't speak authoritatively to it, and I wish Shane was here. But the, the es Escalate model is very Netflix oriented. So you can log in, and the instructor can say, hey class, like we're doing this, then we're doing this, then we're doing this. But it's, it's a choose your own adventure, and individuals can kind of do whatever they want on, on any time, nights and weekends, or within the classroom. And so by measuring who is going to what challenge, in what order, as things are completed and attempt, or attempted and then completed, um, that's a really neat way of finding out what that person's interests are, where their aptitudes, the strengths and weaknesses are, um, what categories appear more interesting and relevant to the general population. And so that information is, is interesting to academia, and I guess to us as well. Uh, so in terms of next steps, um, really just more of this, like this works. Uh, so we've completed the, pilot, the instruction phase of the pilot and now we're going back through all the data to try and mine out and tease uh, out all the interesting things. Um, I, my understanding is next year there will be a formal comparison of the new model, again hands on, you know, no PowerPoints against the existing model. Lots of PowerPoints, lots of multiple choice tests. Um, and the way we're doing it is through another course. So the fourth course will be in, uh, in the spring of 2018. Um, and that will be in, uh, in Maryland. So that is my talk. Um, if there are any questions, I'd love to open up the floor. Um, anything at all. And again, feel free to pull a fire alarm or throw something at me. We're pretty flexible up here. Anybody? Yes, sir. What learning models I might need to hear that again, and I really wish Shane was here. <laughs> I was going to say, what kind of learning models did you use during your three or four different tests that you tried, and which were the most successful? One more time. Which learning models did we yeah, use? Yeah, like Bloom's Taxonomy, those kind of learning strategies and learning models. So Bloom's Taxonomy is, uh, my understanding of Bloom's Taxonomy, the new one, not the old one, is um, what are the learning objectives and to what degree, right? So can students identify something or can they develop a solution or can they, is that, is that correct? So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of the, the higher cognitive uh, pieces. So by the end of the course, it's not enough to say, hey, I know what exploitation is. The students are, are authoring 
exploits. And because of all of the challenges were written by us, the instructors, it, it, inherently they're zero day, right? So they, were, they weren't able to just like find a resource and copy paste it into Metasploit and, and go, for, go for victory. They had to go through things. Um, I didn't talk a lot about the defensive side, but that's, that's really big for DoD because a bigger function, like offensive is, is a little more sexy, but the defensive side is where all the, um, the manpower personnel is. Um, on a defensive side, DoD is very aware that like checklists are bad, right? It's it's a really bad day if like you do this, then you do this. All right, everything is green. We're we're safe. We're secure, right? Like DoD recognizes that that doesn't work, and so we threw a lot of stuff at the students and made them really um, recognize like, oh crap, like everything is implanted, right? Our hardware is implanted, our software is implanted. Like, what do we do? Like, how do you trust a platform that is inherently untrustable because it was built in a foreign country? I don't know, right? But but when you mix enough of that together and have good monitoring in place and good processes in place that the students develop, um, that seems to be more effective than reading about the definition of in encryption and then taking a test that says, I need to know, is encryption like really important, kind of important, or none of the above, right? Like hands-on is just the way to go. Did that answer your question? Cool. Yes, sir? Uh, are there ways to apply to be get into this program? Yes. Uh, so, thank you. That's that's all. As a salesman, like that's that's a great question. Uh, so, two ways you can get, uh, three ways you can get involved. Uh, so, if you are a business, um, you can sponsor a student to go through the curriculum and get involved that way. Um, if you're an individual that wants to go through the curriculum, there are two ways. So, again, we've got COAC. Uh, I'm sure there's a slide. Oh, you can go through the course. Uh, the course is tough, right? It is six months. Uh, it's forty hours a week. Uh, and my understanding is that there's no stipend, so you got to figure out how can you commit six months of your life without income, right? Um, there's a tuition associated with it. I'm not quite sure what that is just yet, but it'll be roughly about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per student um, before scholarships are applied. Um, it will be taught at a community court, a community college course, uh, so um, it will be um, what's called MHEC approved, the so Maryland Higher Education Commission. So there, there should be some college uh, credit equivalencies. Um, so that's one way. It, it, honestly, the shortest path is if you want to take the course, uh, see me after the class or email me. My email is uh, up on the screen. It's uh, evan at point three dot net. Um, the easier way is escalates. So we recognize that not everyone can put their life on hold for six months. And not every manager is going to let you go for six months. Um, and not everybody just wants to be constantly barraged and immersed in this for six months. So escalate for us is a way. It's much cheaper. Um, uh, we have two packages. One is uh, roughly $1,500 for three months. The other is $3,000 roughly for a year. Um, that subscription gains you access not only to the challenges but to the instructors. So if you get stuck, you can like digitally raise your hands and we can either open up an IRC session or uh, a webinar. Um, we have office hours and everything. And that's, again, that's Netflix model. So log in, um, username and password, and you have free range to, the, to all the challenges in the, in the system. Uh, that's called Escalate. And our booth is like right on the side of the wall, and we've got tons of like literature for that. So you mentioned uh, non-security people getting involved in cyber, whether it's federal or private. Um, one barrier I've found is if you're in private and security, and you don't have a degree, and you want to go federal or something. Um, any thoughts on that or? Yeah, it sucks. Uh, <laughs> it, it does, right? And so, like, we, we recognize, right? I, I think this is a friendly audience, right? We get it. Like, if we've got skills that we can demonstrate, like, there's value there in a small, like, my company employs folks that don't have college degrees because they've gone through Escalate challenges and they've proven to me that they can do the job that I'm hiring them to do. Larger employers are working towards that space. So, I, IBM now has something called uh, Gray Collar. So you've got your blue collar jobs, your white collar jobs, and I'm sure IBM has trademarked the hell out of this. Um, they call it gray collar, and, and gray collar is, again, designed to be um, a diversity initiative, right? So I don't need the kid from Ivy League school with the certs, right? Like that's one person, but maybe I can get the individual that can get through some hands-on, um, and that's the new gray collar economy. So if IBM's talking about it, that's going to make waves down the road. I know that there are three Congress people uh, now that recently issued a letter to OPM and said, hey, OPM, this job description says you need this degree. Why? Like, prove it to me. Because unless there's something degree bearing in this job, open it up to all the community college kids, right? Or anyone that has skills. So people are starting to think this way, but 
I mean, your specific question of how does this apply to federal government, like that, that's, that's, that's a slow, slow race. You'll get into IBM before you get into like the federal government, right? Cool. Any other questions? Um, yeah, hi, my name's Mark Gravez. I think there, this might be the perfect time to get this going in the city. They just started a new computer science initiative in the public schools, and the people who are backing it, I think, can really make it happen. So I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah, this, I'd love that. The, the CS you. for Philly just, just launched on Wednesday. Yeah, that's great. Again, we, we've now gone from like professional military down to the community college level. Um, we have a pilot coming up, hopefully in the near future, at the high school level. Um, you know, of course, the intent is to push down, like STEM is kind of a thing too, right? Down to that third grade and, and third to twelve level. So um, we don't have data to back that up that this is effective to a third grader. Um, we don't have curriculum that's really tailored towards a third grader, but we do have data on the college level. So it, it, it has been shown to be decently effective. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you mentioned the uh, OSPF. Is there other um, certifications they help you to pass, like the GX or um, Cisco? Uh, uh, sorry, it's really hard to hear. Uh, sorry. Um, you mentioned the um, OSPF. Is there other certifications that um, your training helps you to pass, like the GX and the um, Cisco certs? So I have very limited data set on that. So we only included, the, I, personally speaking, I do not like the OSCP. Um, what I find wrong with the OSCP, so it's, it is the, it is the best that is out there right now, right? I get that. But the issue, there are two issues I have with OSCP. Number one is the targets are not modern, right? Everything is Windows 95 or there's not, like, the machine is so crippled down that a legitimate user couldn't use that target. Um, and the other thing that I don't like about the, the OSCP curriculum is like the whole concept of try harder is just really nasty and, and, and egocentric. And so like, you haven't figured out this thing that we've like purposely made asininely hard, gotcha, try harder, right? As opposed to like, hey, like you're interested in this, let's nurture that, let's help you up. So OSCP was included because the DoD specifically said, hey, I need I need a benchmark, and it's, it is the benchmark that's out there right now, because it's hands-on, it's not knowledge-based like the CISSP or, or whatnot. Um, we had one student the second year who went on straight from our course to take both the CISSP and the CEH, uh, and he passed both of those on his first try. Um, we don't, we don't train for that or teach that, and so um, it, it's that's not a good benchmark for us. Yeah, I think having knowledge of of, of both, uh, I think um, it sounds like that this would be an amazing foundation, and depending on the GX certification, which is more specialized, depending yeah. on the, the subject matter, it would give them a great head start um, in some of the areas. Right. Yeah, like the CCNA is like Cisco vendor specific, so that's also probably not a good uh, model for this particular type of training. Any other questions? Okay, I just had one thing to add yeah. actually. Um, so. Uh, I, I work on a red team for for a large financial in, um, institution, and uh, I get asked this question a lot. So I'm actually going to plug oh. a little bit for you. Um, but I get this asked question a lot. Uh, so how do I get started, or what do I do? How do I how do I get a job in the field? Right. Uh, my answer is always try to encourage uh, folks to um, get some hands-on, right? Do CTFs or uh, an OSCP. Um, if you have no experience, at least if you do like three months in the lab or, you know, it's, you're at least getting to hands-on even. And his comments on the OSCP, because it drives me nuts too, because I've, you know, I've gone through it, uh, spot on. It's just older stuff, but still the stuff's still relevant, and it's a great foundation uh, for moving forward, plus um, a lot of employers still benchmark you know the certification as well so also he mentioned uh, how much it is for six months if you look at the per cost of a SANS course for a six-day course that's a they're like up seven thousand ish or you know dollars for a six-day class this is six months 40 hours a week for 15 to twenty thousand dollars that's actually a pretty good deal so 
Um, but the hands-on method, I definitely, you know, wholly support that. So no, I appreciate it. Say. And so for us, the way we say it, and, and coming up with analogies, which is ironic, because I'm like the least fit person. But what we say is escalate as a gym, right? Like everybody wants to go to the gym and have the muscles, but very few people invest the time to lift the heavy thing up and down and get the muscles. And so you're not going to learn in a one-week boot camp, right? You'll feel good because you just like basked in the presence of a luminary who shared some wisdom. But then you're going to go back to your office on Monday and you can't apply any of it because you didn't really get it and you didn't really get it because you didn't do it and so the reason why this training is so effective is that it sucks like it's hard you're gonna hate it because you're struggling and that's that is the investment in the gym right that's the heavy lifting up and down and so you'll have your aha moment you solve the challenge you look back like holy shit like I spent like how many weeks learning it but now I get it as opposed to like let me just look up the answer in the back of the book and move on right so um, that's kind of the model that we've come up with I also like how you said you guys work in a team environment, so you know, so there's support, there's building support. Uh, any last minute question? One more question? No? Cool. All right. Thanks. Everybody, um, please give. Our website is uh, itTakesAHuman.com. Okay. Cool.